ಶುಕ್ಲಾಂಬರಧರಂ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಶಿಶಿವರ್ಣಂಚತುಭುಜ ಪ್ರಸನ್ನವದನ ಧ್ಯಾತ್ ಸರ್ವಿಘ್ನೋಪಶಾಂತ a lot can be said about what is yoga uh yoga is uh, a discipline essentially yoga is a discipline uh it is a discipline to link oneself with something that is very significant so we say yoga is a linking process it could be to link with my body it could be to link with my breath it could be to link with my sentiments my emotions it could be at the highest level to link with some higher force in which i have faith so that i receive something from this linking essentially yoga is to link no one is excluded from yoga you know yoga is concerned with body yoga is concerned with my breath yoga is concerned with my mind yoga is concerned with how i can improve myself and whoever is interested in this should plunge into this so there is no barrier at all and i think every human being has a body and there is this breathing mechanism and this extraordinary instrument the mind so no one is excluded and there is no exclusion because somebody is old or somebody is young uh, it's a question of respecting them their age their background but everybody can get something out of this thing because it seems to meet the demand of everyone is possible for example uh, somebody may be interested in uh, the posture how to improve the posture because maybe the person has some bad posture then we have some body positions called the asanas that will help you understand what the problem is and start working on those problems using specific postures these are called the asanas so by the combination of these different specific postures the posture becomes better somebody may have some breathing problem simply an asthma for example and a breathing exercise is very useful for asthma so we may teach them some simple breathing exercises and there they are doing the breathing exercise and maybe it will help them or somebody else may be interested in some inquiry uh, which is what is called meditation using the mind it could be a personal problem it could be to understand the mystery of life who is not interested in this so nobody is nobody is has to worry about this anybody anywhere in the world who wants to make the best out of what nature has given must venture into yoga essentially what people have told systematically over years has been that when a person practices some form of yoga the body aspect yoga of the body or the breathing yoga of the breath or meditation there is a great change in them they begin to appreciate life they begin to appreciate what they have they feel better they feel better in so many ways and once a person feels better even if they have some problem those problems do not overtake them i think this is a very important benefit of yoga i want to emphasize here that we are not trying to do medical work here but what we are trying to do is that by taking care of the human system the body the most vital instrument the brain and the mind we become better we feel better and the problems become less important and this is i think the most profound benefit of yoga and then when somebody says you have cured my diabetes you have cured my back pain you have taken care of my depression it is because they feel better they think their disease is gone
to begin with, the best way to think about is what is more obvious, which is the body. That's why many yoga programs start with the body. Because it is something you can appreciate, you can see, you can compare. How it was yesterday, how it is today. So there is this yoga of the body known as the asanas. Asanas are essentially certain positions we take, positions we are not used to take. That is what is asana. If I am always sitting in a chair, it is not an asana. One day I sit on the floor, it becomes an asana. For an Indian who is always sitting on the floor, to stand on the head is an extraordinary experience. So by these different asanas, what happens is we begin to relate with the body. This is the yoga of the body known as the asana. Then for some other reason or for at another level, breathing may be interesting. In this exercise, the breathing exercise, we begin to understand how the body is breathing, how the breathing is entering the body and what is happening to the breath. Can I extend the breath? What happens when I extend the breath? How it influences my emotions or my mind? So this is the yoga of the breath known as pranayama. There are many techniques of pranayama and because we have many techniques, we can use them for different people, for different needs. Then, I think most essential is the next one, the yoga of the mind. Here, when we are ready, we can use this mind, the different jumping mind, in such a way that the mind, instead of dwelling on hundred things, will stay with one thing for a length of time, like this mountain. No, it's really amazing to see a mountain like this, think of the mountain and receive some inspiration from that mountain. This is what yoga of mind does. When I link my mind with something profound, that gives me something. Somehow, I receive something from that. And that changes me. That changes my personality. It's like if I think of my teacher, who was so considerate to me, I begin to become so considerate. Because he was. This is the yoga of the mind. And at a higher level, somebody who has faith in God can use this amazing instrument, mind, to worship, to pray, to relate with God. That is a religious experience. So even a religious experience requires the yoga of the mind. Fundamentally, these are the three that are very, very important in this yoga. The decision is the tricky business. How to decide what I must do in what is called yoga. Here, I must ex emphasize absolutely that uh, we need somebody to help us. The first thing I would urge is go to your teacher, talk to the teacher, express your requirements. Is it that you are going through a back pain or is it you are going through a depression or is it you would like to understand something about your relationship with God? Speak to the teacher and the teacher will slowly develop a very appropriate practice. So the basic requirement is a teacher and the teacher along with you will develop the right, what you call the practice. And go to your teacher who has some good credentials, but go to your teacher with some hesitation. As I had my own experience, when I went to my teacher, a grand master, I was not absolutely falling my, f you know, myself at his feet. I, I questioned him, I doubted him, I challenged him, until I felt here is a person who is not only knowledgeable, who suits me, my temperament, my interest. So essentially what is required is to go to a teacher with an open mind, but with some crossing fingers, little hesitation. When you find the teacher who understands your culture, and I would say here, who preferably is from your culture, the ideal situation is to have a teacher who is familiar with your culture, preferably who understands your roots, as I said, your own culture. Nothing better than that. 
don't go to a teacher who never understands your culture who he may say throw away your culture it is risky because our mind has a culture and we can't run away from that culture so the brief answer to your question is go to a teacher when you look at yoga as it has developed over centuries and centuries we find that there are many elements in this yoga for example at the simplest level some people are very happy with body so they begin to relate with the body how it is done is we give them certain instructions at how to move the body how to feel when the body is moving this is the body practice of yoga then there is something more subtle and more absorbing which is the breath here what we suggest is we ask the person to follow the breath to know the breath and to develop the breath for that there are many techniques which perhaps we can show many examples and what happens is when a person begins to breathe consciously something changes in the mind and the mind becomes a very new instrument is almost like it was rusted no more it is rusted this is the yoga of the breath then there are people who want to go you go even elsewhere this is where meditation comes to picture yoga of the mind here you channelize the mind you direct the mind you link the mind with something maybe this beautiful mountain which is always constant while my mind is always changing so i can link with this holy mountain here or i can link with the rising sun which gives so much inspiration i can link with some friend of mine who gave me so much comfort when i was in difficulty i can link with a higher force like god this is the yoga of meditation essentially these are the three aspects of yoga it is an accident that this word yoga and this teaching of yoga has come from india it does not mean it is exclusive we in india we use lot of things that have come from the west it's the shoes the trousers the shirt they are very useful for us in india so we use them so anything that is useful can be used by anybody why not so this is not something to do with indian religion or indian philosophy it is something that was evolved in india to make the best out of what we have the body the bread the mind and the beyond so whoever is interested can do that and is anyway that is happening i find that this is happening all over the world the russians the christians the muslims of course the indians it is happening because every human being has the same tools that we in the indians have so we want to make the best out of this so there is no barrier that is one thing useful to learn is yoga has no barrier it is not a religion it is a discipline please there should be no inhibition about this we need to clarify this yoga is not gymnastics because there are gymnastics which are even much more evolved than yoga like the chinese or the russian gymnastics and yoga is not a religion and yoga is definitely not the hindu religion i want to say here very clearly that hindu religion does not accept the teachings of yoga because yoga does not emphasize or reinforce god yoga says if you have some problem examine the problem do something about it so that you can be a better person it has got nothing to do with religion it has got nothing to do with gymnastics yoga is not acrobatic yoga is to know the body and to know the body we need to do some movements some some breathing and if i go beyond this i am confronting my body that is not yoga yoga is to be friendly with the body to love the body 
to develop a nice relationship with my body. Gymnastic is a perverted form of yoga. I'm sorry to say that. And I already said, it is not a religion. But a religious person can use yoga. Because whether you are a religious person or a non-religious person, you need the mind to pray. You need the mind to understand life. That is where yoga fits in. This, this is the reason why, in spite of centuries of changes in India, yoga has remained very vital in our life. It continues to have the same value as it did in the past, because it is not religion. It is something to do with my mind, my breath, my body. And as long as I have my mind, I have a breath, I have a body, yoga is there. Naturally, when we speak about yoga, how did it come to us? If yoga has been a very old thing, how it came to us? This is where we have the fortune of some great masters who put the whole yoga teaching together and present it in a form that can stay forever. Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is that text which is basically a collection of all the yoga teaching in the Indian tradition presented in a very compact way, in a very organized way, so that generations after generations we have some guidance from this book and from that we can benefit and hand on this teaching to the future generations. So we can say that the most important text, the reference for yoga is this Yoga Sutra Patanjali. And this is what is accepted all over by everyone, including in India. And that is what I call the heart of yoga. The heart and soul of yoga is the Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Thank you for asking me about my teacher. I'm very grateful to you. Uh, because here is a very good example how, on one hand, we have this Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. Can I practice yoga with the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali? No. I need a teacher who will use this text and make it more practical. And that's how I understood yoga through my teacher, my father. My father is an extraordinary person. He lived for 100 years, 100 useful years. And he comes from a family where yoga was very important. His ancestors and great ancestors were all yoga masters, which is very rare in India. For thousands of years, in his family, years, centuries after centuries, yoga was kept alive. And this was my father. And he had his grounding of yoga when he was very young from his own father. But he wanted to know a lot about it. So he went and traveled to special places in India like Varanasi to learn more about yoga. And to learn yoga, he knew he had to know a lot about India. So he began to study a lot about Indian traditions and he became an authority in Indian traditions. Then he wanted to really go to a master to know how to apply, how to experience this great yoga. So he came to know about a great master in Tibet, South Tibet. So he journeyed in 1908, around 1908, to Tibet, walked all across the hills, the Himalaya, and found his teacher near Kailash, a holy mountain, on a lake called Manas Sarovar. And he stayed with this teacher for seven and a half years at this plateau, high plateau, and received special instructions. And that is the teaching. Started from his youth, developed in the universities, and realized in the Tibet that he offered to us. And I became a student and stayed on to be a student for a long time. Uh, and I'm fortunate that I'm able to share his teaching today to all of you. This is my teacher, my father. The first thing is, the 
importance of respecting the individuals is already in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. Our ancient people have always emphasized that everything must be adapted to the given situation. It is not only yoga, even rituals, even worship must be adapted according to the situation. We don't have standard form of worship. It all depends on the situation. This is extended to yoga also. Then my father learned this in a very practical way from his master in Tibet. I remember long, long ago, in 1937, when an American lady, Indira Devi, she's a very famous yoga teacher, when she went to study with my father, my father taught her in a way which was different from the way he taught the Indians. She told me that with my body, Professor Krishnamacharya said, go slow by slow, step by step, do not force, don't force the body, breathe very slowly. While with younger people, he was teaching completely differently because he knew it has to be adapted. So it is not unusual that we need to adapt all the different techniques of yoga according to the situation. So it is in the tradition and just we carry on. The way it was adapted in the previous century may be different from the way it will be adapted next century because of the ground conditions. But we have the tools to do that and we can do it. This is one of the requirements of a teacher. He should know how to adapt. Well, uh, this is a question that uh, I don't know how to answer. But what I urge today in a given situation as it exists today is you cannot take a teacher for granted today. Even I did not take my teacher for granted. Even though everybody said he was an extraordinary person, a great master, I s doubted my teacher. I suspected his credentials because he was an old man and he was not explaining in my language and so even I doubted my teacher until I got absolute confidence in him. So what I appeal today is do not fall at the feet of the teacher immediately. Go to the teacher who understands you, who understands your culture, who will not impose his culture on you or her culture on you. But be careful for some time. Watch the teacher. Pay respect but watch the teacher. This is what I would say. It is not easy today to find the type of teachers that existed in my time. If I can doubt my own teacher, who was my own father, I, in the beginning, it's all right. What a book can do today, particularly a book that gives a total idea of yoga, every aspect of yoga, the philosophy, the thinking, the practical application is you are better prepared to look for a teacher. It's like before I came to New Zealand here, I wanted to know what is the climate here, what type of customs people have, is it like American culture or British culture or the French culture. So I got familiarized because of my meetings with some of the New Zealand people. So when I came here, it was easier for me to adapt. Similarly, I suppose a book like this, which is, a, is giving an overall picture of every aspect of yoga, may be a guidance in going to a teacher and I hope I can say this and checking the credentials of the teacher. I hope I'm not to be blamed because today we need a guidebook. It is like a guidebook to look for a teacher. It is a guidebook uh, because it talks about everything about you in a very reasonably simple way because it is in a communication way. This book ha happened in a communication way. There is a question and answer. So it is easy to go through that. So I suppose this book will be a good use for those who look for studying yoga with a teacher. You are not blind with the book. You are a little more uh, open. The purpose of yoga is to understand yourself, to make the best out of what you have and try to solve your problems using your means. 
So the purpose of yoga is to give you your means. You don't need to understand our philosophy. And yoga is not a philosophy. It is a discipline, a process of linking that suits you. It may be different for me, it may be different for you. Fine. So you don't have to either believe or understand this philosophy. And let me tell you, if you are going to understand Hindu philosophy, it will take you centuries. So there is, it is not even worth it. Uh, it, it appears that there are many kinds of yoga. It is simply a question of emphasis. What has happened over years is that some teachers were very much inspired by the body and the postures of the body. So they give a lot of importance to the body and all these postures. While somebody else thought meditation is the most important thing, and so they emphasize a lot on meditation. Then somebody else thought, maybe what is required is uh, uh, something spiritual, something religious, because they were very religious people. So they emphasize too much on the religious side. So this is how slowly the public are led to believe that there are different kinds of yoga. And then what is happening also is in India, which is a vast country with all types of cultures, these local cultures have influenced the practice of yoga. For example, uh, in South, uh, uh, we are a little more uh, warm, you know, and uh, we don't need a lot of uh, st uh, exercise to limber up. While in the North, in winter, it is very cold and it is not heated. So they need a lot of uh, warming ups. So what is happening? The local conditions and the local cultures have modified the yoga practices. This is because of the local situations. So when a lay person looks at yoga, she is led to believe that there are so many types of yoga as if one has got nothing to do with other. But if you condense all of them and put them together, you'll find it's all the same teaching but expressed with different emphasis. So I'm sorry there is this uh, uh, situation but it is because of all this has happened over centuries taking into consideration the different cultures of different parts of India and different emphasis that different masters gave to yoga. That's all, really. Yeah, this is a good question because where is it going to lead me? I would say there are two answers to this question. One is, as soon as I take to yoga, few minutes a day, gradually bother me, do not bother me as much. That is the immediate feeling. Then, slowly, I sen sense a little bit of independence, a little more independent. I can take charge much more than before. So eventually, yoga leads me to more independence. So it is an experience of being in charge. You don't depend on too many things. You can manage yourself. You can handle yourself. You have the resources to handle yourself. And that we call freedom. So yoga gradually leads me to any, my freedom. Not because I'm running away, but I can manage. I can put up with things. Yeah. Uh, here, the goal, when you talk about goal, then we are talking about something else. Yoga can take us to different goals. Surely, it is in my interest. For example, I can use this yoga to become more powerful because mind is a very useful tool. With a mind that is highly developed, I can achieve certain capacities. We call them siddhis. So, some things that were not possible are possible. So, I can get certain abilities. This is one possibility. While there could be a completely different possibility, I can understand things better. I can understand life better. I can understand certain aspects of science better. So, I can become more knowledgeable. 
so there are innumerable goals in yoga but i think the main goal must be a sense of freedom if these powers these goals like knowledge power makes me a slave it is not a proper lead to what yoga talks about so many goals are possible including simple things like to be well to be more healthy but eventually it should be the sense of freedom sahana bhavatu sahana bhunaktu sahaviryam karavahai tejasvinavadhitamastu maridvishavahai om shanti shanti shanti